Let us pray. God, we pray that your word may be an encouraging word for all of us in our Lenten journey from darkness into light. Amen. Amen. The 13th chapter of Luke begins with a discussion that some people had with Jesus. If it were taking place today, it might sound something like this. Some people came to Jesus and said, Jesus, do you think that the dozens of people who were slaughtered while praying at the mosque in Christchurch, New Zealand, were worse sinners than the others who were worshiping there too? Jesus said, not at all. Unless you turn to God, you too shall die. When bad things happen, it's an opportunity for transformation, for healing, for new beginnings. Today we are called to think about our lives and how we want to live. The persons in church community we want to be, not only who we are, but who we need to become. We come believing that Jesus can make a difference in our lives. Remember, Jesus healed not to make some feel bad and others feel good. Healing was a sign of the coming of the kingdom. Jesus came teaching, repent, turn around, believe the gospel. In verse 10, Luke then amplifies this lesson with an important healing story. If you were able, I invite you to stand. Now I would ask you just to put aside your bulletins and bend over. Just bend over and hold that position of bending over. How does it feel? Is it hard to breathe? Uncomfortable? For sure it changes our perspective to be bent over, limits our vision, makes us feel stuck. For you see, when we're way down, it's hard to be alive in Christ or to be empowered to actively participate in God's dream for the world. Suppose you had to be like this all the time. Now just keep bending over as I read from the message. And when you hear the words, standing straight and tall, do it. Jesus was teaching in one of the meeting places on the Sabbath. There was a woman present so twisted and bent over that she couldn't even look up. She had been in this condition for 18 years. When Jesus saw her, he called her over, Woman, you're free! And he laid hands on her, and suddenly she was standing straight and tall and giving glory to God. The meeting place president was furious because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath. He said to the congregation, six days have been defined as work days. Come on one of the six if you want to be healed, but not on the seventh, not on the Sabbath. But Jesus shot back, you frauds, every Sabbath, every one of you regularly unties your cow or donkey from its stall, leads it out for water, and thinks nothing of it. So why isn't it all right for me to untie this daughter of Abraham and lead her from the stall where Satan has had her tied these 18 years. When he put it that way, his critics were left looking quite silly and red-faced. The congregation was delighted, and they cheered him on. Yay, Jesus! Woo. 
succeeded. Yes. So what's this story got to do with us? Think about it. Most of us are burdened with the circumstances of life. On many fronts, it's been rough lately. My shoulders feel heavy. Neck is stiff. Most of all, spiritually burdened down. To be human is to live with experiences, memories, afflictions, and illnesses that cause us pain and suffering. To be sure, some of these are of our own making, but other things that happen are truly beyond our control. They can fuel our fears and insecurities. At times, it's almost impossible for us to reconcile the really bad and almost unimaginable things that happen in life with the concept of our loving God. In recent times, we've become accustomed to hearing people's raised voices venting their anger and frustrations through name-calling, targeted tweets, Facebook posts, and on news networks. No wonder it's commonplace to hear people lamenting about feeling depressed and lonely. In such times, they are living bent over. Each of us, each of us has our own story. Each of us carries some burden, failures at work, failures in our home, living with chronic illness, financial worries, the death of loved ones and friends. Daily, we live with legitimate concerns for our safety and the future of our church and the future of the world. In the face of uncertainty, it's tempting to be overcome with sorrow and with anger or hate to let our shoulders slump and our backs bend, to lower our eyes and to forget that our true identity comes from being a beloved child of God. It's easy to lose hope if we live apart from Jesus. Did you notice that the woman in our scripture is not given a name? She's only recalled as the bent over woman. How would you like to be known that way? Perhaps the townspeople had forgotten her name. We don't know. But we do know for certain that she had lost her identity, her center, her sense of well-being. Bent over described her apparent fate. She lived as a victim. She was different. She didn't look like others. She could not do what others did. The same is true for all who are bent over by labels and named derisively by the world as drunks, cripples, losers, garbage men. But Jesus encountered this woman and restored her life. He did not allow her disability to define who she was. Recall the scripture. Jesus renames the woman. He calls her what? Not bent over woman, but daughter of Abraham. With these words, he places her right in the center of the family of God. He recognizes her as one in whom the promises of God are at work. And he invites her to imagine herself as something other than the world's cast off. It took great courage for that woman to respond to Jesus' call for her to come forward, for she was in the midst of a hostile group. But by making her way to Jesus through that community, she came. By choosing to obey him, the woman began to stand up straight. And when she did, her life became caught up in God's promises for the world. The burdens that she carried 
no longer defined who she was. She was not a victim any longer. Jesus wanted the woman to step out of the role that society had assigned her, and he wanted her to step into a new role, one that was assigned by Jesus, a daughter of Abraham, a child of God. Jesus refused to accept the old reality that governed her life, and he named a new one for her. According to the text, the religious leaders were very, very insensitive to her situation, and they continued to be even after Jesus had healed her. Now, why was this? Because they persisted in clinging to the ways that the world had named her, rather than proclaiming that by grace she had been named a child of God. From their perspective, she was still just a bent over woman. Each time we come to church, we have an opportunity to reenact this text. People come to St. John's wearing various labels the world has put on them. Obese, widow, schizophrenic, divorcee, battered, victim. Here we have the opportunity to lay our lives alongside the gospel and to help others to put their lives there with us. The story gives a new name, a new verdict on life. As we are transformed by the love of Christ, we can go forth as a freed people named Christian. Let us pray that we will grow into the name and come to embody it as we live into God's dream for us and for the world. In today's climate, it is more crucial than ever that we open our hearts to venture peacefully and unafraid to greet the unknown in the spirit of Jesus. We can do so by trusting God to give us the strength to face whatever challenges lie ahead. Living faithfully into God's dream means that our lives will be intertwined with the lives of others. The gospel story proclaims that we are to go into the world to seek to touch the lives of those who are different from us. In doing so, we become channels for God's grace, and we become agents for God's healing. The woman responded to her new name by praising God. We too praise God when we help others to shoulder the burdens that they bear. When we follow Jesus' example, this means most assuredly, that we find ourselves in need of God's mercy as we walk with those who have been excluded, those who have been pushed to the margins of society, prisoners, homeless, LGBTQIA, teenage mothers, Alzheimer's patients, refugees, orphan children living in poverty throughout the world. On the weekend of MLK's death in April 1968, our whole city of Memphis felt totally bent over. But somehow with hope despite this tragedy, a small group of people responded not in fear or finger pointing or hopeless lamentation not in silence or mere rage or paralyzing despair. People of faith came together and filled Crump Stadium, bridging their way across racism and injustice. By their presence, they showed that Memphis cares. Together with passion, these diverse people joined hands, doing all they could to move our city from bent over to lift it up. In response to their witness, wonderful things began to happen. One of the most notable efforts that sprang from the Memphis Cares gathering 
is the Metropolitan Interfaith Association, MIFA. Over the years, many of you, like Sarah Holmes, have been part of this healing force for good in our city. When Memphis Cares 2 comes along this April, we will hear again John Kilzer's wonderful prayer song, Memphis Town. It will be another sign, a sign of healing and transformation. Amidst Lent 2019, it will offer us another chance, brokenhearted and bent over as we are, to join hands to repent and find new life. This new life is a promise called the city of God and just as surely a promise personally for each disciple. You are a son or a daughter of Abraham. Your name, whatever else you might get called, is Christian. Stand up straight. Stand up. Stand up straight and act like it. I invite you to join in a covenant to bear one another's burdens. Simply repeat each line after me. Bear someone's burdens. Bear someone's burdens. Whose? Whose? Yours. Yours. Mine. Mine. Ours. Ours. Theirs. Theirs. Bear each other's burdens. Bear each other's burdens. Touch. Touch. Lift. Lift. Carry. Carry. Share. Share. Free one another. Free one another. You. You. Me. Me. Us. Us. Them. Them. And so fulfill. And so fulfill. The law of Christ. The law of Christ. Amen. Amen. <laughs>